Hello, my name is Thomas. Welcome to British Culture, Albion Never Dies, the YouTube channel and the podcast which asks the question, what is Britishness? Now, this is a question I ask because I have been a Brit abroad for much of my adult life, living in Turkish Cyprus, working in Saudi Arabia, Oman, China, and it's a question that's come to me a great deal, and I very much enjoy all the comments I get, the emails I get, the Instagram messages I get, as we discuss what is Britishness. I always do requests. One of the top requests that I get is to cover the British Empire. Now, I'm not a historian, so perhaps I've played it safe. I started out on this YouTube channel by sharing about three generations of Brits in Cyprus, myself, my parents, and my grandfather. And I was able to include images from the 50s, colour footage taken by my grandfather on his cine camera, as well as my modern footage. And on the podcast, I talked about the British Empire in Cyprus, and I have put the link to what I feel is the go-to episode in the description below. Here, I just thought I'd give a quick summary. I guess the main thing is that it's become for some almost an article of faith that British imperial officers had no knowledge and no interest in the lives of the people that they governed. I find that a very difficult point of view to accept. Because of course, when I was quite young in Turkish Cyprus, I met some of the oldest generation uh, who had been colonial officers, the last of the imperial class, as you might consider them. And their perspective was very different from the one that's commonly ascribed to them. So naturally, I've gone to the original writing, say this book from the early 20th century by Captain C.W.J. Orr. I found it a really interesting book because I think it gives insight into the mindset at the time. I think it shows that actually they did have a genuine interest in understanding, which for me makes intuitive sense because of course today, when you go abroad to live in a foreign country, well, you have to take an interest. When I lived in China, I had to learn some Chinese. When I worked in Saudi Arabia, I had to learn some Arabic. And of course, it's not just a language. You have to learn about the culture just to get things done. That's today when things are so much easier, when there is Google Translate, when there is access to media from back home, when you can keep in touch with people back home, friends, family. Back in the 19th century, in the early 20th century, it was so much more difficult to keep in touch. So I feel you have to have an interest to go out there, spend seven years abroad in the empire. You have to have a certain interest. And if you didn't at the beginning, I think you certainly would gain it towards the end. So I thought I'd show some from this book, I say just for this shorter YouTube video. I hope you enjoy it and I'll be including some of the images that I have of Cyprus to illustrate. First, the preface. Not many years ago, a newly appointed High Commissioner of Cyprus was received by the Secretary of State for the Colonies before leaving England to take up his duties. There are in Cyprus, I believe, said the Secretary of State, a number of interesting and valuable antiquities. I trust that you'll see they are adequately preserved and cared for. I wish you a successful tour of office. Goodbye. It is in the hope that the interest in Cyprus taken by the general public may be somewhat less limited than that displayed by the responsible minister in this incident just recorded that I have written in this book. My self-imposed task has been to describe only the somewhat dull and unromantic details of administration, and readers who desire to learn something of the interesting and valuable antiquities, or of the scenery of this beautiful island, or the manners and customs of its inhabitants, must look elsewhere. For the information about the antiquities, the delightful pages of Kesnola's monumental work should be consulted, and some idea of the romantic charm of the island and its beautiful scenery may be gleaned from Mr. Malloch's well-known book, an enchanted island. A veritable mine of information is contained in Messrs. Lokach and Jardine's Handbook of Cyprus, which discourses charmingly on all subjects, and from the ancient history, geological formation and orthology of the island, to the price of eggs, hotel charges and prevalence of fleas. In addition to such sources of information, a report is issued annually and presented to both Houses of Parliament containing much useful information regarding the finance, trade and general progress of the island. 
I know of no publication, however, which gives a connected account of British administration in Cyprus or describes conditions under which we have occupied it since 1878 and continue to hold it. As a nation, we pride ourselves on our liberal institutions and democratic form of government, but do we sufficiently realise that democracy has its responsibilities as well as its privileges? We boast of our empire on which the sun never sets, but how many of us take the trouble to acquaint ourselves with the manner in which the component parts of that empire are administered, or even where a large number of them are situated? Eminent persons who should be well informed have asked me questions about Cyprus which reveal quite plainly the fact they confuse it with Crete. Others have shown complete ignorance of the most elementary facts connected with the island. When well-informed persons display such lack of knowledge, how can one expect the mass of the community to know or care? Is it right to leave the affairs of an island with a quarter of a million inhabitants to the tender mercies of a government department busy with a couple of score of other communities and their problems and to ask no questions, offer no criticisms? If this book succeeds in inducing anyone to ponder over the problems of Cyprus or the system of Crown Colony administration in general, it will have fulfilled its purpose. But if, by chance, it goes further and arouses in anyone who reads it a feeling that England, in its treatment of Cyprus since 1878, has in any way failed in the generosity and liberality expected of a great power when dealing with its dependencies, surely there is a duty opposed upon a person to urge that we should set our house in order and make good without any delay, any shortcoming of which we have been guilty in the past. We are fond of representing ourselves as the champions of small nationalities and peoples, and we boast of our hatred of injustice, oppression and illiberality in any form. It behoves us, therefore, to take special care that our relations with our dependencies, our attitudes and actions should be above reproach, and that we have done nothing on our conscience which we can be justly condemned in the eyes of civilization. Chapter 1 Introduction The island of Cyprus lies in a secluded corner of the eastern Mediterranean, stretching out a long finger towards the angle where the coast of Asia Minor, running east and west, meets the Syrian coastline running north and south. The picturesque range of hills fringing its northern shores look across the towering heights of the tourist mountains which skirt the Sicilian coast. And on a clear day of early spring, when a brilliant sun shines in a cloudless sky, and the snow-covered mountains stand out, dazzling white against the azure background, an observer looking across the blue expanse which separates him from the opposite coast might well be deceived into imagining himself on the shore of some beautiful lake. Yet, more than forty miles of sea separate Cyprus from the mainland. To the east, south and west, nothing is visible but a great expanse of sea. And though it is said that on very clear days the Syrian coast, sixty miles away, can be discerned as a faint line on the eastern horizon, Egypt lies two hundred and thirty miles to the south, whilst westward there is no land nearer than Crete, and the Aegean Islands nearly 200 miles away. Geographically, Cyprus belongs to the Asiatic continent. Ethnographically and climatically, it may claim kinship with both Europe and Asia. The short winter lasting from December to February is not unlike the same season in Sicily and southern Europe generally. At times a fierce wind sweeps down from the north bringing with it an icy blast from the Taurus snows. And in the island itself, the mountains, which rise to a height of more than 6,000 feet, are under snow for some months, and a keen wind is carried from them to the plain below. Even during the winter months, however, though the nights are cold, the days are warmed by bright sunshine, and fires are hardly necessary except in the evenings and early mornings. By late February, or early March, spring has already set in, and the island is carpeted with a wealth of wild flowers. Fields of yellow daisies, red tulips, purple irises, 
scarlet gladioli, white narcissus, and many-colored ammonites meet the eye everywhere. And by the end of March, the landscape is green with young barley, dotted with scarlet poppies and brought into vivid relief by stretches here and there of bare, uncultivated land or brown fields under plough, awaiting the sowing of later crops. The winter rains which fall in November and December soften the baked ground and enable the farmer to plough and sow his fields. In March and April, showers fall at intervals and refresh the young crops now well above the ground and fill out the grain. By the end of April, the fields of barley have ripened into yellow, though the wheat is still green. Soon, Reaping begins under a hot sun and clear sky. The fields are full of men, women and children, whose bright coloured garments, red, saffron, violet, brown, pale pink, against the background of yellow corn as they reap, form a picture of singular fascination. By June, the sun's rays have gathered force, and a hot wind begins to blow like a blast from a furnace. The bare fields assume a dull, monotonous, yellow-brown appearance and are baked and scorched by the pitiless sun. The broad, treeless plains lose any resemblance they may have had to a European scene and disclose their kinship with Asia and the East. The heat is reminiscent only of the tropics, of the plains of India and the broad expanse of the Sudan. Fortunate the dwellers in the hill villages which nestle in well-watered valleys on the slope of the great Trudos range, cool in their elevation of three, four, and even five thousand feet above sea level. If the villagers were obliged to endure the rigour of winter snow and ice, they can now enjoy the cool mountain air and look pityingly upon their kinsfolk in the scorched plains below, amid whirling clouds of dust or the still more dreadful calm of the burning summer day without even a breeze to stir the heavy atmosphere. Through all the heat of the early summer months, the farmers are threshing their corn on the open threshing floors outside the villages, winnowing it in the evening breeze, and when the government tithe has been measured and removed, taking the remainder on donkeys or in carts their own houses and the merchants' stores. In autumn comes a gathering of the carob bean and the olive, and in the foothills the terraced vineyards are heavy with clustering grapes. By mid-October, the sweltering heat of the past few months in the plains have begun to abate, and the nights are cool once more. But the parched soil and the scorched vegetation await the coming of the winter rains. Soon clouds begin to bank up, only to disappear in tantalizing fashion again and again, just at the moment when they seem to be on the point of bursting and drenching the thirsty earth with their long forward rain. But at last it comes, at first running off the baked earth in a thousand tiny rivulets, till the crust is softened and the soil sucks up the moisture, and little blades of grass began to peep out and change the face of the bare and colourless plain. Soon the fields are dotted with the figures of peasants in their loose black breeches and coloured shirts, walking behind primitive wooden ploughs drawn by a pair of somewhat attenuated oxen, and perhaps an ox and an ass yoked together. And so throughout the winter months of December and January, amid alternations of refreshing rain and grey skies and bright sunshine and blue skies. The work of ploughing and preparing the fields and of sowing for the next harvest goes on incessantly until spring comes again with its wealth of fresh green and brilliant colour and nature renews herself once more. There is nothing of the Vieux Monde Cuisine about Cyprus village life the place of Cyprus in history belongs to a mystery and romantic past rather than to the bustling and prosaic present. 
There are no cities, no industrial centres where man has disfigured the fair face of nature with hideous factory chimneys and polluted the air with columns of black smoke. The Turkish and Greek elements of which the population is composed live apart, in towns in separate quarters, in the country in separate villages. The vast majority of people are peasant farmers, for agriculture is practically the sole industry. And they are small farmers indeed, for the average holding is but half an acre. Each village is a little entity of its own. It elects its own mukta, or headman, every two years, and this functionary is usually somewhat of a despot, often the richest and most powerful man in the community. Except in very small villages, each has its own school and its own church or mosque. Indeed, the first thing that strikes the traveller in the districts inhabited mainly by the Orthodox Christian element is the large and somewhat pretentious stone church in the centre of each village, rising out of the cluster of little dull-coloured sun-baked mud houses, for however poor a village may be, and some are poorer indeed, the inhabitants invariably contribute sufficient funds to build themselves a church, giving the labour themselves, fetching the stone in their own carts, sometimes from a considerable distance, and taking a pride in erecting a building which may be deemed fit for their spiritual needs. There is a charm and simplicity about the peasantry of each country, and in addition to this there is a gaiety and joie de vivre in those fortunate regions of southern Europe where all the year round the sun shines in a clear blue sky, and the days are hot without being oppressive. Village life in Cyprus, devoted as it is entirely to agriculture, runs smoothly year by year, and probably does not differ very greatly from what it has been in previous centuries. Work in the fields throughout the year is fairly constant, but never strenuous. Harvest time is busy, but it is then in those beautiful May days that the sun shines most brightly and the clear sky and the air is soft and spring-like and the nights warm. It is good to see the brightly clad figures of the reapers in the fields and to hear their laughter and the merry sound of their voices. When night comes, the villager will sleep beside the corn stack, piled high near the threshing floor under a sky studded with myriads of stars. In ordinary times, the inhabitants of every village will gather towards the sunset outside the little cafes and sit there smoking and gossiping and sipping coffee till long after night has fallen. But the great days are Sundays and Saints' days, or in the case of the Turkish villages, Fridays and festivals. Let us, for example, pay a visit in Greek Easter time to one of the villages on the northern coast that looks across to the opposite coast of Asia Minor. It lies in a sheltering valley, a little way up the range of hills, looking down on the sea, breaking lazily against a rocky coast. A stream runs sparkling beside the steep main street, and is led off by a score of tiny irrigation channels into the terraced fruit orchards and vineyards below. The sun sets, the church bells toll, and the villagers flock to the little church to attend the Good Friday service. Inside is a coffin decked with flowers, and the church is packed with peasants bearing their hands tall yellow candles from which they obtain from a tray at their entrance and light from their neighbours. One by one they approach the coffin and, reverently kneeling before it, bend and kiss it, and then move on and mingle again with the crowd. The priest drones in a monotonous sing-song voice, pausing every now and then for responses. The crowd wears an act of reverence and solemnity, and towards midnight begin to melt away, the people returning in silence to their homes. On Sunday morning, the village is astir early, everyone dressed in their best. A blue and white flag floats from the church, and most of the houses and shops are decorated with flags and banners. The cake and sweet sellers' stalls are piled high with delicacies of every kind, and the cafe keepers have set out all available tables and chairs in front of their cafes, and have made ready an ample supply of coffee and wine. After church, the day is given over to merriment and rejoicing. There are processions, dancing, feasting, speech-making and music. Men, women and children flock in, 
from the outer-lying villages and join the festivities. Large quantities of the rough wine of the island are consumed, and by nightfall, perhaps, some quarrelling or brawling takes place outside the cafes, but for the most part, the crowd is merry and good-humoured, and intent on enjoying their Easter holiday. In the Turkish villages, very similar scenes may be observed at Bayram, after the long fast of Ramadan, on one of the other Mohammedan festival days. Here is a Turkish village which lies in a picturesque valley amongst the lower slopes of the mountain range, which rises from the central plains and culminates in the great peak of Mount Olympus. It looks down on to the flat, treeless plain below, green with young barley in the spring, with here and there patches of red-brown earth where a field has been ploughed for a late crop. And across this, to the graceful contour of the northern range, clear-cut, against the sky. To the left is a wide sweeping bay in which a narrow rim of yellow beach lies sharply defined against the background of the dark blue sea on which the white sails of a few fishing boats stand out clearly, the whole picture lit by the brilliant sun of a clear spring morning. The village itself is a maze of orange groves for it is famous for its oranges and fruit growing of its staple industry. The sound of running water is to be heard everywhere, and the hum of insects among the orange trees. Little narrow lanes, bordered by the high walls of sun-baked brick, which enclose the orange plantations, wander tortuously up the hillside on which the village lies, and lead to the open space where the bazaars are situated and the shopkeepers display their wares. On a slight eminence, rising from the tangle of houses, stands the mosque, with its graceful minaret overlooking the town. The day being a Mohammedan festival, the streets are full of holiday-makers who have donned their gayest costumes, many of them wearing flowers pinned to their fezzes. In a red-tiled, two-storied house of lathe and plaster, a venerable old Turkish gentleman, in black frock-coat, dark trousers, elastic-sided boots and red fez, is entertaining visitors who have called, in accordance with the custom, to pay their respects on this day of festival. Coffee and cigarettes are brought in on a tray by a youth, clad in loose, baggy white breeches, pale blue stockings with red, ornamental red designs, shirt of pale primrose and a richly embroidered waistcoat. On another tray are sweets, and apricots in syrup, for the Turk has a sweet tooth, which are handed round to the guests, for each of whom a long silver fork is provided, with which he helps himself to the fruit. The host sits on a divan, smoking a cigarette and discussing with his guests all the local news, the prospect of next season's fruit crop, the profit to be made from the one recently placed on the market, the weather, neighbours' affairs, and all such matters of local interest. In the narrow lanes, the figure of a Turkish lady is seen occasionally, clad in a loose gown of dark plum colour or black, her face completely hidden by the yashmak, and only a pair of beady black eyes showing. As night falls, the shops in the bazaars are lit up, the musicians play merry jigs outside the cafes, little coloured lanterns are hung in gay festoons from the minaret to the roof of the mosque. Here and there, a group of people may be seen sitting round a venerable old Turk, who is telling one of those wonderful tales in which all the Orientals delight. The story is followed with breathless interest, its witticism greeted with shouts of laughter and rounds of applause. Such are typical scenes of Cyprus village life. Life in the three or four coastal towns differ little from it, in spite of the comparative sophistication in which electric light and cinema shows are the outward and visible signs. There is, of course, more luxury and less simplicity than in the villages, more graduation of the social scale, more display and extravagance on the one hand, more squalor and poverty on the other. The event of the week is the arrival of the weekly mail steamer from Egypt. The pier is crowded with baskets of fruit, sacks of potatoes, casks of wine and other local produce awaiting shipment to Egypt, whilst close to the beach is a penfold of attenuated sheep 
destined for the Alexandria market and possibly a few oxen and swine. There is much bustle and stir when a steamer is signalled and the shipping agents hurry to the pier and everywhere there is eager curiosity to hear what news the mail will bring. In a short time, the steamer is hard at work, discharging cargo and taking in the live stock and the produce ready for shipment, and the work often continues far into the night. But at last it is completed, and the smoke of the departing steamer is seen on the horizon. The town settles down once more to its normal life, and awaits the return of the steamer the following week, when the same scenes will be enacted in the same manner, only with trifling variations according to the season of the year. Village life in Cyprus in the twentieth century differs little, in all probability, from what it has been for the last three thousand years. The sun-baked mud houses, the paved threshing floors, the primitive agricultural implements all recall the shadowy past, the days of the earliest civilization. The wooden plough with its pointed metal shaft is of the same pattern as those which are seen portrayed on the walls of the ancient Egyptian temples, and similar ones must have been in use for a thousand years. Many of the customs and superstitions of the Cypriot peasant are palpable legacies from the remote past when their ancestors worshipped at the temples of Isis or Aphrodite. It is a curious reflection that when the descendants of the rude savages who inhabited Britain, when Cyprus stood at the forefront of civilization, should, after the lapse of so many centuries, have come from across the seas to aid Cyprus to rise from its long sleep and regain some, at least, of its former prosperity. Well, that was chapter one of Cyprus under British rule by Sir Charles William James Orr, a colonial administrator. I love the way he writes, and I think <laughs> what he writes about Cyprus is so interesting. He wrote this book in 1918, and very, very little of this had changed by the time I went there, at least in terms of the rhythm of life in the island and life in the villages. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I wonder if you have some personal experience of Cyprus or an area that was under British rule. Please do comment down below. As I say, I'm not a historian. I do this very carefully, but I hope that you enjoyed it.